You are listening to Productivity Straight Talk with your host, Amber De La Garza. Amber is a sought-after productivity coach, trainer, speaker, and writer who gives entrepreneurs the straight talk on personal productivity. No BS fluff or overused jargon. Just actionable strategies to get results and succeed in business. And here's your host, Amber De La Garza, the productivity specialist. Welcome, and thank you for listening to Productivity Straight Talk. Today is episode 261, Hiring, the often missed skill gap with Tatiana here. If you're a business owner who wants to learn effective business strategies, improve time management, and elevate productivity to maximize profits, reduce stress, and make time for what matters most, you're in the right place, and I'm so glad you've joined me. Today, I sit down with executive recruiter and talent acquisition leader, Tatiana Kure, to dive into the skill sets of hiring, a skill set that many small business owners lack, but is absolutely necessary. Tatiana shares numerous actionable hiring strategies that are easy to implement and quick to work. What you'll discover in today's episode is what works to attract the right candidate, where to look for them, why clients might skip over your job posting, how to delegate some of your hiring processes, effective selection process strategies, interview process do's and don'ts, the 80-20 rule of interviewing, and so much more. I'm so excited to bring this episode to you so that you get to meet our guest, Tatiana. Tatiana brings her extensive background as an executive recruiter and talent acquisition leader to her work of coaching managers. She has partnered with thousands of hiring managers in a wide variety of industries. She's passionate about helping managers achieve their business goals through effective talent strategies. Tatiana wrote her first book, Hire to Win, Manager's Practical Guide for Attracting and Interviewing Top Talent, to share a blueprint for those looking for a step-by-step guide in hiring. And before we jump into today's conversation with Tatiana, I just wanted to let you know that when we think of growing our businesses, reducing stress, increasing profits, much of that does have to do with building your team and leading them confidently. And in my private peak performance coaching, I support my clients with exactly that. Who on your team is best supporting you? How do you learn to effectively communicate with them and ask for what you need? Do you know what actually needs to be delegated and how to delegate it? Do you know which activities and tasks that you should be doing and where your next best hire should be? These are all conversations around building your team and leading them confidently that ultimately improves your productivity, but also the effectiveness and efficiency of your company. So if you would like additional help to dive deeper into building and leading your team, I would love to talk to you about my peak performance coaching program. You can learn more and schedule a discovery call so that we can talk about what that might look like by heading on over to amberdelagarza.com forward slash coaching. Again, that's amberdelagarza.com forward slash coaching. I look forward to the opportunity of partnering with you to get unstuck, reduce your stress, and determine a clear path forward to growing your business. And now let's meet our guest and get to the straight talk. Welcome, Tatiana, to Productivity Street Talk. How are you today? I'm great. Thanks for having me, Amber. Absolutely. I'm so looking forward to having you here. I think that myself and our listeners can learn so much from you around hiring, the process, and I, it's just such an important topic for business owners. And I have found that it's a skill gap that is often missed. And so I can't wait to dive into that topic together today. Before we jump in, though, I would love for you to share with our listeners a bit more outside of your official bio, but what what made you want to get into this area and write a book on how to hire? Yeah, well, uh, what made me decide to write the book is, you know, two things. One is that 
I have a passion for helping entrepreneurial leaders to achieve their goals through their talent strategies. And one of them is the biggest one is hiring. And so I, a lot of times I volunteer my time to, to uh, help entrepreneurs really um, hire the, the, their first um, role or, or maybe they have found that something that they're doing is not working well and so forth. And so I had found that I was answering the same questions and kind of saying the same thing over and over because really it's, you know, there, there's a art and a science to hiring, but the science really doesn't change. And so I found myself kind of answering the same questions and, and so forth. So I selfishly wrote this book to, to kind of get the, the people who I was supporting to, to kind of come a little bit more prepared, uh, to have a playbook. And to those who I, you know, perhaps couldn't reach, couldn't talk to one-on-one, again, this would help. And then second, you know, I wrote this book. Um, I am I'm the type of person who continuously looks for ways to learn something new, challenge myself. And so eventually in, our, in my career, I kind of found myself, I really like what I'm doing, but I, I feel like I'm, I'm not learning as much as I used to, but I really love what I'm doing. Right? Like I didn't want to do, I didn't want to have a career change or anything. Um, and so I had found that writing a book, learning the process of writing and publishing a book, recording an audio book and so forth, uh, it kind of gave me this opportunity that, that fed my passion for learning uh, while still being in that sphere of recruiting that I really like. Yes, I could only imagine that process. There was a lot of learning opportunities and, you know, also just pushing yourself. I can agree that's such a growth opportunity. And yeah. that's really thinking outside of the box, because like you said, maybe most people would say, oh, I shouldn't be bored in this area. So just, you know, change it all up. And you were able to add in an opportunity that, that didn't shake up your career, but really added to it. Yeah. Excellent. Well, we can start at the beginning of the process and then we'll just shoot through a few questions. Do you have any tips or strategies on how a business owner can get clear about who that hire is? Like they may understand they need to create a job description, but at some point before the job description, there's some confusion about how clear do I actually need to be before writing that job description about who I'm looking for. Yeah. Well, firstly, I have to congratulate you because I listened to your episode 247 on identifying your next hire and you kind of walk through, I forget what it was called. It was called something like, um, Oh, the assessment. Yes. Yeah. So I did a, a your next hire assessment, like asking those types of questions to yeah. get it out of your head. So yes, yes, we did talk yeah. on that. Thank you for, thank you for reminding <laughs> me and bringing that up. Yeah. I mean, this, that's a wonderful exercise. And really like what I really liked what you said was like, it doesn't have to be this perfect job description. Just like, it's a draft form. So be honest with yourself, be honest with what you're looking for, because what ends up up happening where used to happen, right? Where a hiring manager says like, okay, I need to hire, let's say an executive assistant, right? So they go to a job board and they, they look at executive assistant job descriptions and they start borrowing someone else's job description. And they create this like very vague, very, you know, non-descriptive role and they, they post a job and they, they invest a lot of time in interviewing candidates who, you know, probably wouldn't have applied to the job had, had it been more descriptive and more in line with what this hiring manager is looking for. And it would have saved time on both sides, right? Yeah. So, you know, for, for you and, and one of the things, again, that, that you said that I really like. It was, it takes an investment of time today to reclaim time in the future. And it's a hundred percent right. So sit, if you sit down and really identify exactly what you're looking for and be honest with yourself, like, look, you know, is it a part-time job? Is it a full-time job? Do they really need to have, you know, this advanced Excel skills? Do they really need a bachelor's degree? Like re really be honest with yourself. And once, once you do that, 
and write a job description that is so in line with what you're looking for, you're going to have a, a return on your investment of interviewing the right candidates. You probably will interview less candidates, which is great. And then you, you'll, you'll identify the right individual who, who fits exactly what you're looking for. Yes. Okay. I want you to say that again. You may interview less candidates, but that's great. Let's dive into that because oftentimes there's an underlining belief that if you are so specific, you're turning people away. And that's true, but that's what you want. You want it to be so specific. It calls in the right people. And this comes full circle to that's very productive to interview less people. It's a very efficient way to go through the hiring process. If they're self-selecting themselves in or out before you ever even need to talk to them. Yeah, hundred percent. And you know, there's an added benefit that I recently noticed as well is being so specific and descriptive in what you're looking for. Yes, it will turn the wrong people away, but it will also increase the um, diversity of candidates because what ends up happening is most female candidates won't apply to a job if it says, let's say, you need to have uh, expert Excel skills. Well, the likelihood of a female minority candidate of looking at that and saying, oh, no, I'm not an expert. I'm not going to apply. But if you actually describe what it is, what it means to be an expert in Excel in your organization, and let's say it means, you know, doing pivot tables and VLOOKUPs, then that minority is going to say, you know what, I can do that. I'm going to apply where most of the time they actually wouldn't. Yes. Okay. Because you're using more concrete language and examples than vague Uh, very subjective. And I can just speak to being a woman. And I would agree with what you're saying is that we often dilute or doubt our skills that are really, really exceptional, but we might not say excellent to ourselves. And so that would pause us from applying. Okay. I love this. So giving specific examples around each of the expertise. I also like that because I I often find that just in general, when you say, you know, has excellent skills in, we'll use Excel in this example, mm-hmm. um, people don't know what they don't know. So they're like, yeah, I've opened it. I've done a, like, like the spreadsheet in Excel. It's excellent. And you're thinking, oh my gosh, we, how did we miss the mark? And, and unfortunately, it's because we're using this language that's so you know, subjective to one's opinion or, and, or experience. A hundred percent. Yep. Okay. All right. Excellent. What do you feel is working right now around the job postings to attract the right candidates? So I know we just talked about being more specific, but Mm -hmm. the reason I'm asking this is because like every business and Every economy, there's ebbs and flows. And as of the recording of this episode, it's incredibly challenging to find candidates and or employees to fill roles. And so when people are so selective and the job market is not saturated with uh, people looking for employment, do you have any tips or strategies that someone can use early on to edge out maybe the competition or all the job postings that are out there? How can they stand out? Yeah, that's such a good question. So one of the things that I would want to remind hiring teams is that it's a two-way street. You know, while the hiring manager is looking for candidates, for the right candidates, the candidates are looking for the right opportunities, right? So when we write job descriptions that are, you know, just bullet points that ask for what we're looking for and give nothing in return to the candidate as to why they should apply, the likelihood of them kind of skimming through it, maybe applying, maybe not applying is high, right? So if you actually want the same investment back from the candidates that you're putting in, then you have to make sure they know what's unique and special about your organization, about your specific role that they should apply for. So, you know, one of the things that I really like is, you know, kind of breaking down, like, here's what we're looking for. Here's what we're all about. Here's why you should consider working for us. And a lot of times, 
what, what's really important to candidates now are beyond the compensation, right? Like no longer are candidates just chasing a bigger, bigger paycheck or a bigger title. Now they're looking for, you know, life work balance, you know, what is the corporate values look like? What do you stand for? What's the mission? How do you go after it? Uh, what's the DEI initiatives look like and so forth? How am I going to bring my whole self to work? So they're looking for that. So the more concrete, right, and, and the candidates are not looking for, you know, uh, vague values that you would put on your corporate walls, right? Like they want it to be genuine and authentic and speak to them. So that way, when when they go through the interview process, they'll ask questions about it, right? Yeah. So you want to be able to, you know, you don't want to sugarcoat anything. You want to be really honest about what it's like to work there. But you you want to make sure you just you really describe what's unique and special about your organization. The other thing that I have found work really well is in addition to being really descriptive as to what you're looking for, is really describing what success looks like in the organization, right? Why is that? Because most candidates will ask, well, what does the career path look like for me in this role? And no longer are they going to accept the answer of like, whoa, you know, I'm I'm looking for someone to take over my job at some point, right? Like they're actually looking for specific answers, concrete answers. So if you include things like, here's what success look, looks like in our organization in, in three months, six months, 12 months, then they'll they'll come prepared with, with questions and you will be prepared with answers, right? Because you're th- yeah. this will force you to kind of think about, well, what would happen after 12 months <laughs> if they're successful, right? Absolutely. So then, uh, so, so if you put that directly in a job description, then you will have a much more productive interview. Uh, I love all those tips. You know, with uh, business owners that I speak to, I actually had a client I was speaking to this last week and her thought was, well, why would they want to work with my small firm when there's these large firms out there? And, you know, you could flip that on its head, which is, which was what the thought that I offered her. It is true that some people are going to be looking for the opportunity, a larger firm. But what I offered her was that, what if you just came out and not as a weakness, but led with that? Because mm-hmm. I believe that there's people out there that would feel compelled to work with your firm because they have a bigger input into the firm, your firm's success. They can contribute more. Their their job has a bigger impact and they can see that. And I think that if I didn't even think of that when I was speaking with her. But if you just led with that and part of why you'd work with us is that this role is very impactful to the success of the company, which is da, 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 da. I believe that would draw people in because they do want to contribute and be part of something. Yeah, I mean, that that's such a great advice that you gave because really in smaller organizations, not only will you make a bigger impact, you have a bigger voice, you have a seat at the table. And a lot of times you would be doing a lot more things you wouldn't be doing in a larger organization. So you may even leapfrog your career to the next step that you wouldn't be able to do in a larger organization. So yeah, to to flip it on its head and and look at it as a positive and kind of leading with that uh, is a great advice. Okay, excellent. So I want to transition into the next phase is, let's just say we nailed the job description. We were so descriptive. We've got candidates applying that seem to be qualified. Do you have any strategies around moving through to the next interview process? Like what's the selection process once you're receiving applications and or resumes? Do you have any tips to help make that decision making easier? Yeah, so there's a couple of things. One, um, a lot of times you're, you know, even if you're the business owner hiring for your first hire, most of the time you likely will have other people help you through the interview process. Um, so you're, you're not just the only one. But even if you are, perhaps you need to shift gears and switch your hat from being a hiring manager to doing a technical interview or, or what have you. So you may want to, uh, one of the the uh, advice that I would give is to really think through what the interview process would look like before you even interview anyone, because one, uh, you will be much more prepared. You can have, you know, a, a conversation with all your interviewers or really start thinking about your own schedule. How, you know, how are you going to delegate, you know, some of the tasks and so forth. So, so you make the time to, to interview and 
how do you structure those conversations so none of so not all of them are sound the same right like walk me through your resume what are your strengths what are your weaknesses why do you want to work here but you you really start thinking about diving deeper into each person's background and make sure there's a mutual fit short term and long term so that's one like re- really identify what your interview process looks like and then I second, I, sorry i don't want to i don't want to interrupt you so remember yeah. your second but i i do want to dig deeper on your first because that yeah. was such a great tip you said getting clear about the process so you can delegate out. I have an idea of what that is, but are you, I, can you go further into what that might look like? Because hiring, when you are the the business owner and that often falls on your shoulders, it's, it's daunting the process. Yeah. Yeah. So can you give me some strategies? And then I can also chime in. So how could you delegate some of this hiring process out? Right. So for example, if you are looking for someone to add to your skill set that you don't have, right? Like if you're honest about yourself and I'm going to use Excel again as an example, but if you're specifically looking for someone who is going to add to the Excel skill set and data providing to your organization, you you want to think about how are you going to assess that skill set, right? And if, especially if you're not the expert in that, who are you going to engage in order to assess that? So perhaps you have someone on your team who uh, would be able to, to do a technical interview, but perhaps you use an assessment, right? Like perhaps you, you identify a specific assessment that would help you identify the, the technical skills that, that you're looking for. So think about what's important in your role that you're hiring for and how are you going to assess that? Oh, th- those are so great. So there's lots of different assessment tools out there. It's worth Google searching. I've done some of my own homework on that as well. And it can be from either technical skills and it could be soft skills as well that can be um, tested or an assessment created. So it's not just on your shoulders. Those are those are great, great examples. The other example that I have, I just want to throw in there is, you know, if you choose to go from application to say a phone interview, generally the phone interview is really basic and it's short and you're getting some just like, you know, top level information to see if you want to go to an interview. I've often recommended to my clients, like, is there someone on your team that can do those phone interviews and just document the responses? And then you can do the face-to-face interviews. Like, because those, even though they're shorter, 10 or 15 minutes, there's more of them and have your scale of like who gets put to the next one. And then you can do the face-to-face interview. So I just wanted to throw that out. That is an example in the process that might be able to be delegated out at some point. Yeah. And honestly, there's so much uh, new technology coming out where, or you can even be scrappy and not use the technology and kind of create your own process, but like asking candidates to record the answer so you can listen on your own time is also valid. Like as long as you know, you're, you're being fair to their time and, and and so forth. And you're not creating, you know, an hour worth of, and and frankly, you wouldn't want to, to, to listen to an hour worth of each person's uh, uh, recorded um, answers. But if you're really honest about like here, you know, I'm just looking for, for you to answer this question uh, via recorded um, session, then, then you can listen to them as well. So there's lots of, lots of opportunities to outsource, and delegate uh, some of those uh, interview steps out. Okay. All right. That, that's really good. I hadn't thought of that as well. Um, all right. So then let's move to interviewing. Now, this one, you had actually shared a, oh, no, no, we're not going to go to interviewing. You had a second, if you yeah. remember, because I'm so sorry I interrupted. <laughs> you have a second tip. So let's go to your second tip. Yeah. And and thanks for interrupting. I'm glad we kind of went down the rabbit hole there and gave some additional tips. But the second is really knowing um, what kind of candidate you're looking for, right? So there's kind of the plug and play, like I kind of have, um, uh, you know, these tags of candidates, right? So there's the role player, the plug and play, someone who has done that, that uh, exact role somewhere else, and they don't need a whole lot of training, they're, they're going to be plug and play. There's pros and cons to each, by the way, right? So that plug and play person, the role player person, they're likely leaving their role because they're not not challenged anymore. So are you prepared to challenge them further? So what does success look like in six, 12 months? How are you going to engage them further? If not, 
they likely will leave. So you you want to be able to think through, is that the right candidate that you're looking for? The other is, you know, kind of that stretch candidate where they're looking for their next role. So they may have done some aspects of the job. Uh, this will be their next big move um, uh, for their career. What that in- involves from you as the hiring manager is that training time, right? Mm-hmm. So are, are you willing to invest that time in them? There's a return on investment there because they likely will stay longer. They likely will be more loyal. Uh, they likely will want to continue to grow your, their careers with you, but you need to have that investment of time and training them. And then there's like those head scratcher candidates. Like maybe they have, maybe this is a step down for them. Maybe they've done bigger jobs and they're applying to your job and you're kind of scratching your head. Like, why are they even applying here? Right. Yeah. Um, so, so those candidates, a lot of times they have a backstory, like for whatever reason, maybe they decide to take a step back in their career to um, take care of their family at home. Maybe they have other commitments, whatever the case may be, but it's easy to dismiss them um, just based on the resume. And I have found that some, some of the best hires I've made personally have been those head scratcher candidates, if you're willing to listen to their story and to make sense and there's a mutual fit, but you need to decide you know, before you start interviewing, you know, what's the right type of candidate for you and where are you going to invest your time? Because frankly, if you really don't have time to, uh, to train them and you really are looking for that plug and play and you're, you're okay for them to leave in six to 12 months, just as long as that, that they're there uh, for now, well, then you're going to be, you're, you're going to easily be able to pick out those specific resumes from hundreds and hundreds that you should be receiving. Oh my goodness. I have never heard it said that way. That is so great. I just want to add, you know, asking that question of what does the business need? Because again, as small business owners, we often filter it through our own lens. And so if we were to say something like, oh, what do I have time for? Well, the answer is going to be like nothing. Why did the person leave? Like, why am I even hiring? I don't have time for any of this. And so if if we know that it's an investment of time, if it's a plug and play and that is the best fit for the business, perfect. If it's someone you need to invest in, then it's about how do you create the time, prioritize the time, because ultimately you're deciding with your your best hat on and advocating for the business that that's what the business needs in that role. So I just Mm -hmm. wanted to add to what you're saying, but how you broke it up into those three areas is beautiful. I have actually spoken to clients who got those resumes where they were overqualified and they're like, what's wrong with them? Instead of coming in and saying, oh, what's their backstory, which you so beautifully said. And when you say it that way, you're like, of course, I'd want to support them if there's this backstory on why they're making this transition that doesn't seem so obvious to ourselves. Yeah, and, and like I said, some 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 of the best hires or at least connections that I've, I've made um, have been through those conversations uh, that are head scratchers. Um, where w- what happens most of the time with those candidates is that they come with some hidden talents that they mm-hmm. don't write on the job on their resume because they don't think it's relevant. But once you talk to them, like, oh my gosh, like you're actually can fill like two sp- spots in my organization, <laughs> right? So. If, if, if it makes sense, it, it definitely will pay out. Yes. Okay. So I'm actually going to go backwards because this is how my head's thinking. I have this burning question. And so for those of you that are tracking with the process, we're going to take a step back. Where do you recommend people are looking for candidates? And this is a loaded question because, man, it just seems like there are opportunities like I'll just throw out there like indeed and then they change everything and it becomes so expensive or Mm -hmm. there there, or there's a platform that worked and then now it's just junk candidates and so I'm just wondering in your experience uh, what's working right now where can these business owners be posting for for these job openings you know what's interesting there's no one size fits all where it really depends on the industry, geography, um, just so many aspects. So what I typically say is like, if you were going to go look for another job right now, where would you go? And a lot of times that's the right answer. So 
LinkedIn, um, you know, is great for, you know, the roles, the, the organizations that I've supported, right? One of one of the biggest buckets is financial services. So LinkedIn for financial services in New York or like any metropolitan area is great. Um, however, I was talking to someone in Connecticut for a nonprofit, and we happen to have been talking about LinkedIn. And they're like, no way, we don't use LinkedIn at all. <laughs> you know, we, we use monster.com. I'm like, really? <laughs> you know? um, so so it really, it really matters on, you know, where do you get the, the information specifically around your industry, specifically around your geography? Sometimes um, there, there's so many job boards specific to industries right yeah. now. I work for an organization within freight logistics and there's a specific, you know, job board just for freight logistics that I would never have gone to until I was in the industry. So you, you really need to be honest about your industry and, and where, uh, where you would go to, to look for another job. Okay. That is such a great answer. And I think it is so true that it it is changeable and it changes with time too. Cause like when you said monster, I was just like, oh my gosh, that is like yeah. so 10 years ago. And yeah. so you're right. Like that's in my perception and my reality of where I'm at. So I love that you said that is that you really just need to ask, where would you go if you were looking right now? Mm-hmm. All right. So now that I've asked my burning question, we're going to go forwards and it's to the interview process. When we're really looking to have that confidence that we are selecting the right candidate for our business, what are do's and don'ts? Like, are there, are there any like popular do's and don'ts you have for recommendations around the interview process? Uh, well, so I one is be very specific initially to to know exactly what you're looking for because it's very easy to fall in love with a candidate who happens to you know uh, think like you, look like you, have kids in the same school district as you, go on vacations as you, and so you you go into this conversation and you're like, oh my gosh, we have so many common interests, we can spend so much time together. Great, go have a drink, go have dinner together. <laughs> like you don't. Need- <laughs> Yes, <laughs> you know. Um, what what helps with that is being really honest about a what you're looking for, and what questions are you going to consistently ask. So that way, you're you're kind of catching yourself from falling in love with someone who just happens to be a great conversationalist versus really answering your questions to to the best way that you're looking for for those answers. So that's one. So that way you can have a, a, a level level playing field of, of for all candidates and, and be able to make a, a, a well informed decisions based on the, on the answers that you're looking for. Um, the second is again going deeper beyond of like walk me through your resume. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? But specifically asking questions that are going to get to what's important to you and to your business. And then third don't give away your answer. So what I mean by that is don't say like, hey, so it's really important in our organization that you multitask and you, uh, you know, are able to uh, juggle a ton of different projects. By the way, have you done that before? Okay, well, so <laughs> I'm laughing so hard because I have admitted here on this podcast, that was me. I'm like, man, if I was looking for a job, I'd want me interviewing you because I will tell you everything you need to <laughs> shake your head or nod your head. You're like, yes, I do that. Yep. That's exactly me because I would get nervous. Well, this is early, early on, right? But I would get nervous and do all the talking. And I realized I was literally giving them all the answers to the questions. Yeah, but if I have to say that's really a common mistake in the interview process. Um, and so, uh, you know, just being very, being very honest with what you're looking for, designing questions that are going to get you to, to what you're looking for and make sure they're open-ended questions. Right. And like, just, just, just stop talking. Just say like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> like have you ever managed multiple projects? <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> or could you give me a time where you manage multiple projects? So the more open-ended questions you get and actually shut up and listen, right? Like as an interviewer, 
like there's a rule of like 20, 20, 80 rule, right? Like that the 80%, the candidates should be talking at least 80% of the time. If you're talking more than that, if you're talking more than 20%, the likelihood of you giving away the answers is very high. So ask a question, listen, um, and give them space. A lot of times what I've learned is the more you stay quiet as an interviewer, the more likely the candidate will want to fill the silence and give you more information. So, it, you know, don't jump into, as soon as they answer the question, don't jump into, okay, and here's another question. Here's another question. Like, let them talk, let them, let them tell their whole story and you'll learn a lot more. Yes. And I think that, so I think tip three goes back to tip one of like, you know, if you're chit-chatting, you're thinking like, oh, I want them to like me. And tip one was like, okay, then go have drinks, right? Or go, you know, make a friend on the side. But this isn't the time while you do want them to to like you once you are working together. It's really about getting to know them more during this process. So there's a time and place for all that chit chat. Yeah. And and, I mean, and I will say the fourth tip that I would give is you still want a lot of time for the candidate to ask you questions, right? Because a lot of times hiring managers, when they're interviewing, they'll schedule 30 minute interviews and they'll interview the candidate for 25 to 27 minutes. And then they'll leave a couple minutes at the end for the, the candidate to ask questions. And of course, that's not enough time to ensure mutual fit. And especially if a candidate uh, is gainfully employed somewhere else, uh, you've used this term as well, Amber, where they're like, they'll go with the devil they know, right, versus the devil they don't. And so th- they will likely feel like they don't have enough information to uh, to make a decision to move forward with you. So you still want to make sure you, you leave, you know, proper like 10, 15 minutes of your time to, for the candidate to ask you questions. But it, it, it's uh, intentional versus uh, kind of chit-chatting and, and, and finding common ground just for for friendship making. Yeah. I mean, I can think of times where if you give them that time and you find out they've done research or they've found out who your clients are, how you serve them or other, like just if you give them that opportunity to ask questions and you realize they're really interested and they've done homework on your company, I mean, that's best case scenario. That's that's that organic piece that that may be unexpected than just sticking with the strict questions to 27 minutes of the interview. That's right. All right. So we get through the interview process and, you know, we really just want to make that best decision. And, you know, what I find is that it's like they're they're waiting for like one person to pass and everyone else to fail because when the worst case scenario is you have multiple options of highly qualified candidates. And I say worst scenario, meaning no, that's actually best scenario. But for the business owner, what tends to come in that I hear sometimes is like, oh my gosh, like how do I make the the right decision? when there's not one standing out above all else. And I'm just wondering, do you have any experience with that? Like, what do you determine as a tiebreaker? Is it is it skill set over skill set? Is it character? Or maybe something completely different? So, uh, so I would say there, there's two parts. Uh, one is being consistent in how you look at data, right? So I, whatever format that you decide to use, just being consistent in how you look at each candidate, right? So if you've decided that technical skills is really important to you and that's a no-brainer, well, then then you, you're going to have to look at all the candidates valuing technical skills first, right? Um, yeah. But but that may not be the right approach for you. One of the approaches that has worked for me really well is actually from my colleagues in project management, where they kind of talk about a system of uh, decision making in time cost impact, right? So how mm. much so the way I would look at the, the hiring process of, of deciding whether or not to bring someone in is how much time will it take for them to um, to get up to speed with where you need them to be, how much would it cost you, and what's the impact that they're going to make? So that's one of the systems. But whatever system works for you, th- that's fine. Just use it consistently so you can consistently look at the data and make the best, well-informed decision. So that's one. The second is, you know, I would remind you that 
in general, technical skills are a whole lot easier to train compared to the attitude. And you've talked about this as well, Amber, before as well. But, um, you know, I'm not I'm not telling anyone to value uh, attitude or cultural fit more than technical skills. But if you as if you think about what's easier to train, I would say uh, it's a whole lot easier for you to send them to an Excel training course versus uh, a training course on having entrepreneurial entrepreneurial mindset. Yes, yes, you're right. I do say that. And I say that a lot around, you know, actually this often comes up around after you've made the hire and there's challenges. I've, I've found that it's helpful to work with my clients and describe it as, can you define it as, is it a skill set challenge or is it a um, the character challenge personality, you know, and that could be around either character, um, personality, ethics, culture fit, you know, mostly anything that is not the skill set based. And the reason I like to narrow that down is because I find that skill set is like, oh, well, if that's lacking, like you figured it out. Let's fix that. Is it worth fixing? And the answer is it's worth fixing and helping them as long as they have the right attitude and they're a fit and they're cultural and a uh, fit with the culture rather. And so, yes, I do say that. And it's often after the hire and there's challenges, which side of the lane is the challenge showing up on? Right. But if you think about that, even during the interview process and just yeah. on who to bring on, Hopefully you address that challenge before it's too, before you already have that person uh, on your team. Absolutely. Well said. Okay. So we are just assuming we've made it through job description and interviewing. What happens? And then I'm just like working through the process in my head. So now we're making the offer. Mm -hmm. And is there any closing strategies to get us to the finish line of really, uh, you know, attracting this this best hire for the business? Yeah. So one, I would say if, you know, I, I always kind of talk about, uh, always be talking about potential offer, right? Because you don't want to get through, you know, the four or five rounds of interviews, whatever it is, right? All the way to the end. And then you're extending an offer and you're like miles apart between what the candidate was thinking about and what you're thinking about. So you want to be able to address that very early on. In fact, you know, some um, some states uh, are mandating that you list the the, the compensation on um, on the job description. But even if you don't like really bring that up as early as you can in the interview process and continue to bring it up. In fact, one of my uh, one of the advice that I give is like bring it up in every conversation that you have because the candidate uh, may be interviewing somewhere else. Their their expectations may have changed. Learning about the opportunity, they've realized that you know that what what they would need in return could be different. It could be more, but it could be less. By the way, if if all of a sudden they learn um, that the job is remote and they thought it was going to be in you know in the office, their compensation expectations may have changed because of that. Um, so you you want to be able to address that you know, with every conversation. So when it comes to offer making, there's no surprises. Everybody's on the same page. So that's one. Yeah. Okay. That's a great tip. But I'm thinking that what happens if you're early in the interviewing process and you are not on the same page? As a business owner, do you continue with caution, hoping that you guys can get on the same page? Or is that just like a hard no and we should pass to save our time for someone that is on the same page for compensation package? Well, it depends how much flexibility you have, right? So if if the candidate expectations, let's say, is double from what you're willing mm -hmm. to pay, um, then there's there's no reason for you to continue for for this particular role. I, I say like you should absolutely continue to have a conversation with them and maybe if they're a great candidate, build a pipeline for the future, make a note of it, uh, end it on good terms, but but don't invest your time and the candidate's time if you're if you're clearly miles apart. But if there's some flexibility and you can and you think about, well, okay, like I was thinking about this role, but but you're uh, I've just learned that you can actually also bring this additional talent to my team and I could uh, and you could fill two gaps within my team where I was thinking about one and all of a sudden you're creating you know a, a different structure within the team 
um, then it, it makes sense for you to continue the conversation. Um, but but really, if you have a, a specific budget in mind, um, I, I wouldn't continue to invest your time because really no, no one is going to get out of that conversation of that interview process in the happy in the happy way. Yeah, yeah. All right. So I think as to close up, one of the last questions I have for you is how long is this hiring process typically? And I just want to give some context to that question. I believe some people want to move fast and faster than they're comfortable with because they have this assumption that people are making decisions super fast so they have to. Mm -hmm. They rush to maybe a decision too early. And then there are some people that are just, you know, it's avoidance of making decisions and a little procrastination. And so maybe they're on the way longer end. Is there a solid answer as to, you know, what is the, the candidates looking for regarding a typical hiring process time frame? Yeah, what the candidates are looking for is transparency. So, or, and the fast, fast turnaround. That doesn't mean fast hiring. That means fast turnaround of communication. So, the more the hiring manager is prepared to talk about the interview process, like, okay, this is what my interview process looks like. There's three more interviews that you're going to go through. You're going to hear from me in two weeks' time. Okay, then the candidate is set for two weeks because they've they've just heard from you that it takes two weeks for you to get to the next step. But uh, so, so as long as you're honest about your, your process, that's fine. You don't have to make fast hiring. However, what I would say is uh, if you do have someone great in front of you and you're just one of those hiring managers who says like, well, I just want to see what, who else is out there. I want to see some more candidates. You may lose this perfect candidate in front of you. They may decide to to go somewhere else. And if you're okay with that, um, then then that's okay. Then you should continue through the process. If you're not okay with that, like you, you that's why you need to be so honest with what you're looking for and your decision making formula that you're going to use. If that candidate is checking off everything that you're looking for, then I would ask like. Why do you want to see who else is out there? You have the perfect person right in front of you, right? So, yeah. um, so I, I would I, I would kind of challenge to say like why why do you want to he- see more candidates? So again, it's it's not you know one size fit all answer as to how long it takes because sometimes like some roles you know especially right now you know tech roles take forever to fill right. So for you to to know that it will take six months to fill a role like that's that's what the market tells that that's what the market says that it will take. So whereas you know if you're looking for an executive assistant like. Like you should be able to fill that within 30 days, right? So if it takes you longer, then you need to reevaluate your process to see like, well, am I, is my job description, you know, worded the right way? Am I going through the interview process the, the way that I intended to do it? If, if, if there's opportunity to change something to make it faster, if, and it makes sense for your business, then you should make those changes. Well said. Alrighty. So this has been really chock full of amazing tips and strategies and examples. I thank you so much for your expertise. I would love for you to share with my audience how they can find your book, share a little bit about your book, because I think this is a perfect segue if they want more information about this topic. Sure. And then also, if you would mind sharing a few ways which you work with your clients, there are people listening right now that are saying, those are great strategies. Tatiana, uh, but how can you help me? Because I don't want to do it or I don't want to do it alone. So why don't you share with us? Sure. So you can get my book, Hire to Win, a practical guide for attracting and interviewing top talent on Amazon. It's available on uh, paperback, uh, audiobook, and Kindle. And then you can also find me on my website, howtowintalent.com. There's uh, different ways that, that uh, I would uh, offer to to partner with me. There's actually tons of free tools out there of uh, creating a job description and offer letter and so forth. That that's all there. Um, but if you need additional support, um, then I'm happy to to partner with you. The way I partner with hiring managers now is at coaching level. Um, so it's more about like look like you're going to have to do the work. But if there are specific uh, aspects. 
uh, of hiring that you're challenged with. So it could be of creating the interview uh, matrix uh, or creating the job, uh, the, the interview questions or creating, extending an offer. I'm happy to, to help in, in those areas specifically that, that where you're challenged, but you're going to have to do the work. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being here today and sharing all your expertise with our listeners here. Thank you for having me. I have loved having you listen to this episode of Productivity Straight Talk. And I sure hope you found the conversation with Tatiana to be valuable and insightful. But that alone will not help you. So I need to be straight with you. No change, no change. Without taking action, nothing will change for you or your business. We covered a lot today in the interview because I asked the questions I know you have about hiring. And the hiring process does not need to be perfect. What I would love for you to do is take an area, a specific phase of the hiring process that you feel not as confident about or that you're struggling with and narrow in on those actionables to make those tweaks first. And then you can come back and listen to this episode or reach out to me about working together to really fine tune the process from beginning to end. The worst thing you can do is walk away from any episode, but specifically this episode feeling overwhelmed. So My request is that you select one thing that you will take action on around the hiring process so that you can get the results in your business. And again, if you do want to dive deeper and get support around building your team and leading your team, then I would love to talk to you. You can learn more about my peak performance coaching program by heading on over to amberdelagarza.com forward slash coaching. Again, that's amberdelagarza.com forward slash coaching. If you have not already done so, I would so appreciate if you would take the time to hit subscribe and leave a review. This is the best way to let me know what you like and enjoy about the episodes here at Productivity Straight Talk. And if you really love this episode and you have a friend that is an entrepreneur and business owner who you know is struggling with hiring, share this episode with them so that they can also learn from our conversation here today. So that's my straight talk for today. Until next time, have a productive week.